Good morning. Welcome to Thompson Road Baptist Church. We're glad that you've chosen to join us today as we seek to worship the Lord our God and sing praises to Him. We are thankful for each one of you today. If this is your first time visiting with us, we're especially glad to have first-time guests. As you leave today, we hope that you don't slip away too quickly. Uh, we'd have a little gift we want to give to you, as well as a visitor's card, a connection card, if you're uh, interested in filling that out, so we can write you a letter and let you know how glad we were to have you. As you go out the back in the lobby and look to your right, there's a welcome desk there. There'll be someone there to greet you and give you those items that we mentioned. Uh, so glad to have each one of you. I know we have some other visitors that have been coming recently and maybe some uh, family members. So we're, we're just glad that each one of you is here uh, to join us in exalting the Lord and worshiping the Lord and offering him meaningful expressions of praise. A couple of announcements before we do that, though. Uh, we have got our Friends and Neighbors Day. Uh, you should uh, hopefully have, you've been able to grab a few of those cards that look like uh, the picture on the screen. They're out in the lobby on the uh, various tables. Uh, and that is this next Sunday. So uh, really trying to uh, make a push to invite those that you've always wanted to invite, but maybe never thought about uh, what would be a good day. Or here's, this is a great excuse. There's also going to be a little bit of a sweet treat to send everybody home with at the end of uh, the service that morning. So grab those cards, hand them out to uh, some of your friends, neighbors, maybe co-workers. Uh, we're praying that the Lord would bless uh, that day as well. And I know Pastor Joe will have a, a message that will be especially suited to having uh, visitors that day. Uh, at the end of the month, we have got host home fellowships coming up. And it's not a grill and chill at Pastor Joel and Sarah's house. <laughs> Going back to our uh, original host home fellowships that we've had uh, at 6 p.m. that will replace our regular service at night. So uh, 6 p.m. host home fellowship. There will be a location here at, Gra at Grace Place, but then we've got a couple of other locations. You can go and sign up on uh, the sign up sheet in the lobby. Um, so and that will help the hosts know how to count and know how many people are coming. So we're looking forward to that at the end of the month. Then as well, uh, we've got our ladies book study, our new one starting up in September. And so um, uh, Ms. Sarah Stevens uh, gave an announcement about that at the end of last week. Uh, so uh, if you weren't here for that, you can ask her about what, uh, what the book is about. Uh, but the books are here, so they're at the table, and I think she'll be at the, at the table at the end of the service. Uh, you can see her for the details and how much the book costs, but I know that uh, they're excited for uh, this book study uh, beginning in September. Well, as we begin worship today, we're going to be considering uh, the identity of Jesus Christ, and that is the Son of the living God, which is what his disciple Peter declared in Matthew chapter 16, and we'll begin reading in verses 13 through 16. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I trust the reason that you're gathered here today is to affirm that same sentiment that Peter echoed a couple thousand years ago. We trust that each one of you uh, believes in your heart that Jesus truly is the Christ, the Son of God, the, the Messiah that takes away the sins of the, of the world. And so we've gathered here to affirm that and to worship and glorify uh, God the Father, uh, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, the great three in one. Let us pray and worship. Heavenly Father, we do affirm with Peter that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we thank you for what the Son has accomplished in dying for our sins and raising from the dead so that we could live with you forever in heaven, that we, through you, might experience victory and power over death, hell, and Satan. And that is not something that we can boast in and of ourselves. It is only because of what you have achieved. We can have eternal security and peace, knowing that uh, you, our maker, have redeemed us. And Father, for those that they don't have that peace, 
here on this earth. They don't have that peace looking ahead to the next life after death. They don't know what would happen if they were to die today. I pray that uh, you would use us, uh, the people who are, um, uh, that we come in contact with, our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers. Uh, may we be a light to shine uh, your grace and your word in their light, in their life. I pray that we would uh, not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but we would share uh, the word that we have, the hope that lies within us. And I pray for those that could not be here. I know that uh, I think of Vicki Murray recovering su from surgery. I pray that you would continue to help her progress. And uh, we pray for others uh, that are battling, battling physical illnesses and those who uh, regularly aren't able to meet with us. We pray that you would be with them in a, in a special way. We miss them and we love them. And we thank you for those who are gathered here today. May our heart's desire be to truly uplift you and worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Our songs that we'll be singing this morning all focus on uh, the, the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He is our Savior. And so the first three songs that we're going to sing today, uh, we're going to sing one right after the other. And so Sarah will play a little transition between. But we'll be singing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. My faith looks up to Thee, and then You are the Christ, Son of the Living God. The words will be on the screen as well as the numbers for their books. Would you stand with me as we begin singing number 43, the first, third, and fourth. Crown Him with Many Crowns. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Mark how the heavenly anthem drowns, oh music, but it's all. I'll break my soul and sing, the wind who died for thee, and with him as thy matchless sea. Oh, 
good singing. You may be seated as Jen comes and continues to minister before the Lord in song. I don't have words on a screen, but if you turn to page 298, I've been thinking about all my relatives who I pray for that, well, they need Christ. Jesus is tenderly calling you home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will you roam farther and farther away? Calling today. that makes possible our salvation. It is his grace that draws us ever nearer. Would you stand with me as we sing one final time out of the Wild Songbook, number 13, Jesus, Your Grace, verses 1, 3, and 4.
Well, may the Lord help us to love the church as he does. The Bible says Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it, Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, so thankful for each of you here this morning, and uh, praise the Lord for uh, those that he gives that uh, drive just to be faithful week after week. And some of you I know work through a lot of obstacles, barriers to be able to be here to worship God and learn his truth and connect as his family and uh, serve him by serving one another. Thankful to have uh, Gloria Yancey here with her daughter and uh, keep praying for her recovery. And she's making up for lost time with hugs. So you can watch out for that. She, if you already got one, you might get seconds after service. Uh, we're glad to have uh, Gary Grossman, Tripp's brother, with us today. And Arthur, who is here this weekend after uh, uh, several months uh, working at Camp Joy this summer and then out east as well where he's been working. And uh, just everyone here, and we're thankful for uh, the Coors. Welcome to Great Grand Baby. We prayed last week. Uh, baby Paisley was born Tuesday. So we've got uh, proud new great grandparents that might have pictures with them if you want to see uh, the salutes as Pastor and Ellen are celebrating anniversary today, I believe 57 years. So we're glad for Glad for those uh, things that we enjoy together as a church family and just appreciate God's goodness. So thankful for some first-time guests with us today as well. Glad the Lord led you here, and we hope you'll be enriched by our time around the Word this morning. Uh, this is the end of the uh, Bible in Real Life series that has brought us through uh, most of the summer here. And we've been seeking to apply God's Word to contemporary issues. And though this series ends this morning, obviously this is something that every day, every week of our lives that we're continuing to come back to God's Word and allowing it to inform and direct our daily lives, our decisions, our, our thinking, our, um, our uh, morality, and all of these areas because God's Word is all-sufficient. It gives us everything we need for life and godliness and truly furnishes us to every good work so that we can be complete followers of Christ. This morning's topic is what the Bible has to say about work and career. And you may think work and career are just synonyms, they're the same thing, but work isn't always just what you do for a living. Uh, some of you go to work, some of you work from home, uh, some of you uh, don't have a job or uh, a means of gainful employment in terms of monetary compensation, so maybe you don't go to work, but you stay home and you work, maybe not from home, but you work at home or you work helping others. And uh, some of you get up and go to work and some of you come home and work and then on your day off you work and maybe you go to a friend's house and work and then you come to church and work and these are generally very good things. One main thing we want to see from scripture this morning is that work is very good. It's a good thing when it's done God's way and for God's purpose. A headline caught my eye the first of this month. Here's what the news headline says. Help wanted $78,000 a year to taste candy while sitting on your couch. <laughs> well, I've seen, uh, you know, my share of clickbait, and I usually scroll right by, but you had to have to check this one out if you see that come across. And uh, Candy Funhouse is an online retailer of confectionery treats from chocolate bars to gummies and licorice, and they're hiring uh, for a work-from-home job as chief candy officer. Uh, so I don't know what your resume looks like. Personally, I've been doing that for free. I don't know if maybe you would say the same thing. Got to capitalize on that. But apparently many thousands have already applied for the position. So if you miss, miss out on that uh, sweet gig, uh, maybe your work, I'm guessing, is not quite so easy or instantly gratifying. And work often can instead be very burdensome and very toilsome and even at times seem fruitless or futile. That uh, thing that you just fixed is broken again. That mess you just cleaned up is a mess again. Those problems you just solve crop up and you finish a hard week of work, you show up uh, for the next week of work and it's all, all there again. Uh, and work can become a battleground for sin, of course, if we don't work enough, that's a problem. If we work too much, that can be a problem. If we work, but we do it with the wrong attitude, it can be a, a, a sinful problem of the heart. Or if we work with the wrong goals and purpose as our priorities. And so what does God's all-sufficient word te teach us about this real-life experience uh, that occupies so much of our time and energy? 
probably you spend at least half of your waking hours in some form of work. Some of you spend much more than half of your waking hours working. What does the Bible help us to, to see as a way to set our minds and our approach to uh, this area of our lives? Well, let's turn back to Ephesians chapter 4, where we were last week. We looked at the last two verses of Ephesians chapter 4, and in the context of putting off the wrong things, renewing our minds, putting on the right things. So we saw to put off anger, to put off bitterness, and as our minds are renewed, we want to put on forgiveness. We want to put on compassion, kindness, and uh, that, that biblical response uh, when people bother us. And it's, it's the principle uh, there in chapter 4 of Ephesians of the old life and the new life. And um, verse 22 talks about putting off concerning the former conversation or lifestyle of the old man. Verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And verse 24, put on the new man. So there's this biblical pattern as we face different areas and aspects of life that we are putting off that which is sinful, renewing our minds and replacing it, putting on that which is righteous and pleasing to God. Remove, renew, and replace. And then Paul gives several examples. And see if you can see what is to be removed in verse 28. And then as we put on, as we, we, uh, what needs to be removed as we renew our minds through Scripture, what needs to be, what needs to be replaced with. Ephesians 4, 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. All right, so here's our remove, renew, and replace. It starts with uh, what we have from Scripture regarding work. Number one, if you're stealing, stop. <laughs> okay, so theft is forbidden. If you had planned to go from here and knock off a bank, you know, we can't. We can't do that. But, of course, we have to look at, we can't just gloss over Scripture and say, well, I'm not going to rob a bank, so you know, keep going, what's next? Uh, because with every sin issue, we need to examine deeper into our hearts. Just as Jesus said, you can, uh, uh, you know, m be guilty of murder just by a heart disposition. You can be guilty of adultery just by a, a sin that, that is in the heart. So what is there of a principle that we need to address? Uh, theft, if we say, is taking that to which you are not rightfully entitled or uh, refusing to relinquish that to which someone else is rightfully entitled. Theft can be a, 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 an issue that, that we need to be careful of. So at work, if I'm surfing the web, shopping online, booking my vacation, you know, when I'm being paid to work in excess of my allowed breaks, that could be, uh, you know, you've probably thought about this before, that could be a, a form of theft. A freeloading off of friends and family for extended periods could be, by that definition, a heart issue that is related to theft or freeloading off the government for extended periods of time when you could and should be earning a living could be a form of, form of theft. Now, obviously, friends and family uh, ought to be willing to help, and we've been at, in times in our lives where we've needed to lean on that help. And government resources, we can be thankful when they're used as they should be, and using those things is not wrong, but abusing them becomes a form of theft. Withholding from an employee the agreed wages or bonuses and benefits that are deserved is a form of theft as well. So if you're stealing, stop, and then the command is, rather let him labor. So if you're not working, work is the next thing that we get to. Rather let him labor. Um, there are situations that can at times, you know, disabilitate or, or keep you from from work, and sometimes people are looking for work and aren't able to, uh, but sometimes we're just looking to do everything we can not to work. And um, our two-year-old, Lauren, she is a total freeloader. We've got a picture of her. Uh, she just kind of, this is Lauren. She, she does not pull her weight at home. She thinks <laughs> that if she just smiles and cuddles and is cute, then she earns her keep that way. So. We had to put Lauren to work in the kitchen. I think there's a picture of that, too, so that she can be busy. And she is uh, finding out some a little ways to, to help out around the house. All right, so if you're steal, stealing, you've got to stop. If you're not working, work. And then thirdly, if you are working, here's what you need to know. From a biblical perspective, work is godly. 
when our work is good and when it's used for good. So let's spend our time talking about those three elements, about work being godly, about how to make sure that our work is good and that it's being used for good. Now, work is godly. It's not just a necessary evil. Oh, well, you know, it's too bad that work is, is around. I wish the life was just without it, but we have to have it to be able to pay the bills. Um, work is not just a result of the curse. Oh, work is there just because of sin is there. Our work ought to be good. Okay, so rather let him labor doesn't mean you can just work doing anything anywhere, take a job at the bar or the casino, or, uh, you know, you got to be aware of the pyramid scheme or of the uh, deceitful hustle, uh, but to engage in something honest, useful, and productive, and then to use it for good. Our goal in work ought not to be to become rich or famous, or to be viewed as successful, uh, but to please God. It pleases God when we work honestly to meet our needs, to work faithfully to meet our family's needs, to work generously to meet others' needs. So uh, let's open to the very opening of Scripture, as we've done several times in this series, to get our foundations. Stay back to Genesis chapter 1. And we want to really see that work is... Godly Work is a godly activity uh, to be part of our lives. Genesis chapter 1, first we'll read verse 1, which you probably already know if you're still turning, you know it from memory. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Our God is introduced to us as a worker, one who accomplishes a creative and productive uh, a work. And throughout chapter 1, as you scan it with your eyes, you can see again and again this language, and God made, and God made, and God made this, and God made that, and you see this kind of language, and God called this, that, and God called this, that, and that God caused this and that, and God is working, He's arranging, He's creating, and to, all the way up until chapter 2 and verse 2, where it tells us that uh, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them, and on the seventh day, God ended His work which he had made and rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Work is godly. Very key verses for us here in chapter 1, though, are verses 26 to 28. Let's look at these one more time. God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So notice we're talking about God creating us in his image and along with that creation giving dignity, value, worth. We've talked a lot about that this summer. But also with that creation, he gave responsibility. He made man his image bearers. Men and women equally as human beings bear the image of God. And part of what that entails is the responsibility of continuing the work that God had finished and would rest from. A man and woman were the last things that God created. And once he had these image bearers, he rests from his work and puts us to work. He puts Adam and Eve to work. He gives to mankind those responsibilities that you see nestled right in there in the middle of verse 28. One is to have dominion over the earth. So the natural resources of our planet, man is put in charge as image bearers of God of, of doing the work of exercising dominion. And then another key word there, right, connected with it in the middle of verse 28, they put them in the earth to subdue it. And that involves, um, you know, just a, a leadership a, a, a reigning over the animal kingdom. A dominion over the earth involves, you know, agriculture involves all the resources that are mined out of our earth. Uh, it's the idea of subjecting the earth and bringing it under human control. Obviously, we can't control the weather or the earth's orbit or things like that, however hard we may try or wish we could. 
But we are to have dominion, and we are to subdue it, and those things take work. And he put Adam and Eve right to work right away. Chapter 2 and verse 15 uh, tells us how God gave uh, to Adam and Eve this garden, and he put them there to do what? To dress and to keep it. Notice there hasn't any sin been committed yet, and yet Adam and Eve are put to work. Work is godly. They're continuing. They're maintaining this work that God created, and he keeps it going. But as image bearers, he is delighted when we uh, work to uh, maintain and to harness and to subdue and to exercise dominion over the earth and its, its inhabitants in terms of the animal kingdom and plant life and so forth. In verse 19, man is given the responsibility of naming the animals. God created a lot of things, and he named some of them, but what was created on day six, these animals before uh, man, uh, man is given that responsibility of naming. That's another work that is a practice of that dominion and that subduing. And so work is part of God's nature. It's an important element of God's image. It's a good thing, a godly thing created before the fall so work is not a result of the fall. It's not because sin is here, now we have to work. It was created before the fall, but sin does impact our work in negative ways, of course, as we would expect. So in verse 19 of chapter 3, as God is explaining the different consequences of sin, the elements of the curse that would be upon humankind, upon the serpent, and specifically upon the earth, it says this in verse 19, that in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. What happened? There was work before the fall, but after the fall, survival would require work, and it would be a toilsome work. It would be a hot and sweaty work. It would be an unpleasant work that required you know, grit through difficult circumstances. So now when we work, we toil against a cursed earth. Verses 17, 18, and 19 there in Genesis 3. Now in our work, we toil against futility. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Solomon talks about how you can work so hard and it seems that as you look back on years or decades of work that the wind can blow it away or that it didn't have any lasting value and that work just, you know, you won't even be remembered for it, it might seem. Work can be futile because of the fall. And now in our work, we toil against and, and work against our own propensity toward laziness. The book of Proverbs, especially uh, chapter 6 and the end of chapter 24, have these warnings against the laziness that would, would uh, cause us to avoid that sweat of the face, that toil that is required for continued survival. And yet there is coming a time when the curse will be lifted, and it's good to know that work will actually be part of existence even after the lifting of the curse. And as God makes a new heaven and a new earth, in that new creation, there will be work responsibility. Uh, let's turn to the other end of Scripture, all the way to the back. We started in the front and laid this foundation. Now we want Revelation chapter 22, where as we're making a big biblical picture of how we ought to view work, we're seeing that it is part of existence in the new creation. Not in that exact term. I don't think the word work or labor or toil is going to show up uh, in the context of our activities in, in the new earth. But Revelation chapter 22, beginning in verse 3, says, There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So here is this work, this responsibility, this service to God, part of its worship, no doubt, but it won't be limited to those uh, direct, you know, declarations of God's praise as if all we do is, is sing throughout all eternity. But that service will have a broad scope, I believe. And verse 4 says, they shall see his face, his name shall be in their foreheads, there shall be no more night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. And look at the end of the verse, they shall reign forever and ever. There will be these uh, reigning responsibilities of oversight, or we could say of managing. There will apparently be this structuring uh, that those who have been faithful with a little in this life will be uh, given rule over much in the next life. And so uh, these service 
and reigning uh, responsibilities are areas of work that will be a reality in the new creation free from the elements of this curse that has been lifted. So it'll no more be by the sweat of our face. You won't have to uh, work in uh, you know, heat or against sweat or fight laziness or worry about income taxes with this work. It will rather be fulfilling, delightful. But I believe that in the new creation, you know, in addition to serving God, managing things, so part of that will be uh, creating things, maybe building things, producing things like music and art and structures and so forth. But it will be perfectly balanced with rest. As Hebrews 4.10 tells us, in terms of the toilsome work of earthly life, that he that has entered into his rest hath also ceased from his works, just as God did from his. Well, God has ceased from work, yet he continues to be active in our world. And he will again make all things new and do this creative work. So we will cease from our work, yet we can continue in being productive and expressive of God's glory in the new creation. Work is godly when our work is good let's focus on that part of it Uh, doesn't mean that everyone has to work in a charity or in vocational ministry Uh, there are a lot of areas of work that are good as part of god's purpose as a reflection of his image as a fulfillment of his dominion mandate to subdue and and to work and so Um, If you're looking for work, maybe you're a young person trying to find what your calling is or or you're between in a transitional place, Um, God can direct you to the right work through your abilities, through your desires, through your circumstances, through wise counsels of others who are believers in your life, and through prayer as you're seeking His will. In the meantime, you ought to do what your hand finds to do seeing that our earthly work, if it's a good work in some way related to God's dominion mandate, if it in some way reflects His image, that it is godly and it is good work. So school is work. If you're a student, you're learning the order of the universe, the matter and space and energy created by God. And you're learning to exercise dominion by gaining a grasp of how it all fits together. If you're an engineer, you take the physical laws that God has ordered this world upon And you exercise dominion by designing in their cooperation with this for progress and industry. A builder takes the materials harvested by miners and loggers and craftsmen and from earth's resources and the designs produced by engineers and architects and exercises dominion by structuring them, turning empty or unusable spaces into habitable, useful space. A homemaker subdues the lifeless brick and mortar and wood of a house and exercises dominion by turning it with warmth and nourishment into a home. A musician orders and arranges the cacophonous tones that our ears are capable of distinguishing and exercises dominion, filling our spaces with beautiful and enriching sounds. A farmer breaks up, cultivates, fertilizes, seeds the earth, exercising a dominion dominion that leads to sustained and sustaining harvest. A butcher, a baker, a chef, a cook, they take those ingredients yielded up by the earth and the animal kingdom and exercise dominion, crafting them into that which works in harmony to please and to nourish. Uh, We could say the same, you know, a financier takes the resources God has entrusted and exercises dominion, investing them for meaningful use, or a healthcare professional who takes biology and the makeup of the human body and exercises dominion, applying treatment and care that combats disease and decay and and promotes growth and health. And maybe, you know, probably didn't list your area of profession, but it can be a helpful exercise for you to look at what you do and find how it contributes to God's image-bearing dominion mandate that he gives to man to subdue the earth and to make this cursed place that is plagued by sin, but yet maintains God's beauty and structure and be able to enrich and enhance and subdue and to create and to uh, make a positive, productive uh, reality uh, come out of the good that God has made, though it is cursed by sin. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Our 1 Corinthians 10, 31 finishes with, whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. 
So maybe your work seems mundane, and maybe it's hard for you to connect it with the dominion mandate or the command to subdue, and it's maybe in a secondary way instead of in a primary way like some of these examples that I've given, but to find how what you do enhances, enriches, incorporates what God has given and turns it into that which is good is a helpful way to look at what God has given you to do, what God has called you, equipped you, or, or just put you in a position where you just show up and do it, uh, that it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Finally, when it's used for good is when it's a good thing. We could do work is, which is godly, and we could be doing a good work, uh, which is a godly thing, but when we do it in the wrong way or with the wrong motives... Uh, it could negate the good and godly elements of it. So it is possible to overemphasize work as a source of fulfillment or as a source of advancement, whether it would be building up those bank accounts or climbing the ladder of career. It's wise to make financial plans. It's not wrong to accept a promotion and to be a hard worker that works toward that. But we want to be very careful that our work never becomes uh, something that is for personal fulfillment as the priority or personal achievement as a priority, personal advancement as a priority, personal enrichment and financial gain as a priority. Uh, we run into those dangers of materialism and greed that we've talked about recently. Uh, we could run into those dangers of, of workaholism uh, that we talked about recently. You ought to be able to have loved ones around you who are believers, that you can ask, am I working too much, or is work too big a focus for me, and be able to listen carefully to their answers, to see that not only that work is godly, that your work is good, but that you truly are using it for good. It can be easy to say, well, I'm, I'm providing for my family, and then that turns into something where uh, serving God and even family provision start to take a back seat to really trying to provide luxury or or um, climb that ladder of success. So we're always on guard. And even with the good things, because sin is present and because the devil is present and because our world is twisted and takes everything God has created as good and, and turns it and twists it just enough so that we can feel like we're doing right, though uh, sinful motives have crept in. So um, Ken Casillas writes and invites us to view work as dignified. Work is more than a burden and more than a means to make a living. It's integral to our glorious purpose as those who are being remade in God's image. That's the end of the quote. But let me read it one more time. Work is dignified. It's more than a burden and more than a means of making a living. It's integral to our glorious purpose as those who are being remade in God's image. So there are, are uh, five ways that you can use your work for good. And we'll end with these. Number one is serving the Lord. Whether you're a plumber, a pastor, a painter, a pediatrician, your work ought to be serving the Lord. John 4, 34, Jesus said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Could you take that approach to your work, your life's calling, whether you're on the clock or whether you're working at home or whether you're working at church, that your meat, your sustaining drive is to do God's will and to finish his work, to be an extension of the work he did in creating, the work he's doing in, in saving and edifying. Let's turn to one more passage. That's Colossians chapter 3. Thank you for turning to the middle and to the back and to the end, and we're here in the heart of the New Testament again. It's helpful to see these are just very important verses in Colossians 3 that shape the way we think about our work. Yeah, you work for your supervisor, or you're working for your manager, or you're working for your boss, or you're working for, uh, you know, that, that gain, that profit, and, and all of those things. But ultimately, we ought to see it as serving the Lord. And this is Paul's uh, context here in Colossians 3, he's talking about our earthly work, but inviting us to see it, though we are serving earthly needs and earthly masters, to see it ultimately as service to the Lord. Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, 
do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. All right, are you still awake? Are you still tracking with this? Our work is godly and it's good when it's used for a good purpose. And Paul says here, you know, we're working and we want to work hard. We want to obey our masters according to the flesh. That means your earthly overseers in, a, in an honorable, in a diligent way. Uh, but ultimately, we ought to see it as service to the Lord. That's when it's used for good, when we're serving the Lord. Secondly, when we're providing for needs. We've touched on this. We know this is an important part of work. We do what pro provides for our own needs, to provide for our family's needs, to provide for the needs of, of those who are impoverished all around us, and to provide for the needs of God's ministry. So to provide for our own needs. Second Thessalonians 3 says that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Them there are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So it is biblical to work for your own sustenance and, and to meet your own needs. But of course, 1 Timothy 5.8 reminds us that it ought to be for your, your family's needs. If any provide not for uh, his own and especially for those of his own house, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So it's important we're seeing that our, our family, our home, our household is provided for but also the needs of those around us, the impoverished. Remember today's text where we started, Ephesians 4, 28, let him that stole steal no more, rather let him labor, working with his hands. Do you remember how it ends? So that you can be rich and successful. It is not how it ends. Let him labor with his hands, a thing that is good, that he may have to give to him who is in need. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at 1 Timothy 5 and how they that are rich are charged this way. Uh, sorry, sorry, that's um, 1 Timothy 6. They that, do, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, that they will be ready to distribute, willing to communicate, to have that sharing heart. And the needs of the ministry, Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all thine increase. Look at that wealth that you are building, not just as uh, something to uh, advance your own financial goals, but to uh, be dispersed in the needs of, of the, uh, starting with your household, and but beyond that as well. Work is used for good when we're serving the Lord, when we're providing for needs, and then when we're maintaining a testimony. Your 9 to 5, or your 5 to 9, or your 12 to 12, or whatever it is that is your work in the marketplace, or in the home, or whatever it is, uh, make sure you're viewing that as part of your testimony. Because no matter how secluded your work is, your production, your attitude about it, your attitude toward anyone you work under or over or alongside of is a, a major part of your testimony. If you're spending half or more of your waking hours in this capacity working, it's part of the way that you, are, as you're seeking to reflect God's image, ought to be reflecting his heart and attitude about what you do. First Thess Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 11 and 12 says that you should be quiet and do your own business and work with your own hands. Why? That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without. Unsaved people ought to look at Christian believers, their Christian coworker, their Christian employer, their Christian employee, that Christian homemaker that they know, that Christian uh, volunteer that they know, that, that Christian uh, who is just a handy person at home or whatever it is that they know and see someone with a heart to be productive, a heart to help those around them, a heart to provide for the needs of others, a heart to work diligently, a heart to work respectfully with others, obediently with overseers. And it's a, it's a powerful part of our testimony. And the Bible instructs us to, to think of our work as an opportunity in that way, as a responsibility in that way. Our work is used for good. Uh, fourthly, when we are finding fulfillment, there is something biblical about finding fulfillment in the work that you do. To take pride in it, not in, a, in an egotistic way, but in a satisfaction way, the way God, when he finished creating, he looked at everything he created and said that it was good. 
He looked at it all and said it was very good. He is glorified by it, satisfied through it. And by the way, when we look at what God has created, when we consider uh, the heavens and, and the earth, we ought to have our, our uh, view of God enhanced as well and be turned to worship Him as we see, see the result of His work. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 uh, though earlier in the book, Solomon will recognize, you know, the futility and the time-bound nature of earthly work that seems, you know, toilsome and empty at times, that there is this element that God is blessed with. Uh, Ecclesiastes 5, 18 to 20. It is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he maketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him the power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. Um, when I talked a moment ago about how much time you spend working, and if you have a full-time job, you probably say, yeah, I spend more than half my time working, so you have work outside of work as well. And uh, I know some of you who are retired might say, you know, you're working more than ever. But there is a gift from God of being able to enjoy the fruits of that labor, both in what you've earned and in a sense of what you've accomplished. God wants us to take satisfaction in the achievements of our labors, but not as an end goal, not as the primary focus. It's only in so far as we are obediently pursuing that image-bearing, uh, dominion-exercising mandate that He has given to us that by advancing and subduing and being industrious and being diligent and working hard and turning profit, that the profit isn't the goal, that the advancement is not the focus, but rather the reflection of God's image and His glory uh, through obedience is our goal. Finally, our work is used for good when we're working uh, to accomplish God's purpose. Accomplishing God's purpose ought to be the overriding a theme of everything that we do in life. And as we go to work, to ask that question, how am I fulfilling uh, my dominion mandate? How am I subduing in some way? How am I providing for others? But ultimately, how am I serving the Lord? How am I having a testimony? How am I reflecting His image? So uh, work for Him. Rely on His strength as you work. Whether it's the ninth load of laundry that day, or the double shift with overtime. Pray to Him throughout the day and ask Him to make your work a meaningful contribution to your, uh, your environment in terms of the people around you, uh, yourself, your family, the lost who witness your effort, and God's dominion glory throughout the earth. If you... Um, don't have a relationship with God, or you have questions about your relationship with God, as you come to this topic, uh, maybe you have tried to find satisfaction and fulfillment in life by getting out of as much work as possible. You think if you can have the most fun and have the most excitement and, and you know, you just keep, keep work in its corner so that you can live it up, uh, you'll find what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 2, that it really does end with emptiness. Solomon enjoyed everything that was available. He kept nothing back that his eye desired, he said, in his great wealth and power, and he found it to be empty. Avoiding work uh, for favor of play will not lead to satisfaction in life. Maybe you find yourself in the position that you're trying to find satisfaction and meaning fulfillment through work, and so work and career has become that consuming focus that you're looking for deliverance through in terms of finding meaning and finding purpose, finding satisfaction, finding fulfillment in life. You need to recognize that that's a cruel taskmaster as well because the work never ends. And when it finally does because you're, you're no longer able to do it or because you've gotten so much you realize you can stop doing it, uh, you'll find that you are left with nothing that you can take with you. And really, friend, as Jesus says, what would it profit if you gained the whole world through all your hard work, if you lost your own soul? Because the treasures on earth are corrupted by rust and eaten by moths and go out of style and deteriorate over time. Maybe you've tried to find satisfaction, uh, fulfillment, even salvation, through your own 
spiritual work, and you think that if you help others enough, if you help out at church enough, give to church enough, pray enough, avoid wrong works enough, and do good works enough, then God will fulfill and satisfy you and, and grant you entrance into His new creation for eternity. Friend, the Bible is very clear with us in Titus chapter 3, uh, that it is not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy that he saves. Or in Ephesians chapter 2, by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of works, uh, it, and not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Take these scriptures and realize there is no volume, no quality of good works that you could ever produce that would merit God's favor or that would bring spiritual satisfaction or peace in your soul. It's only what Jesus has already done. He alone lived a perfect life and gave that perfect life by dying on the cross for you so that the goodness, the righteousness that you can't possibly obtain through works uh, you can obtain through his works. And so could you humbly today realize that all your toil, uh, though you might accomplish a lot of earthly good, will be no of, eternal, of no eternal value and of no merit for your soul when every one of us has an appointment with death, Hebrews chapter 9, and after this the judgment where human righteousness is in God's eyes, Isaiah 6 tells us, as dirty rags. Only Christ's righteousness uh, can gain God's favor, His merit in your life. If you've never been saved, or if you have thought that you're saved because you're trying to live a good life, but you've never been born again at a time when you realize that your works can't earn it and that only God's grace can give it through the works that, God, that God's Son, Jesus, has already done, uh, you can embrace that today. And you, Jesus says, my yoke is easy my burden is light. He says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. You will find rest to your soul. The work doesn't go away, and you don't stop doing good works because we are not saved by works, but we are saved to good works that God has ordained before so that we should walk in them. But don't look at your work as a means to salvation or God's grace. Look only at Jesus' finished work on the cross. He cried out as it grew dark and as his life expired, it is finished. You can join with the one who has finished the work, though you continue to play a part in it uh, by accepting God's free gift of salvation today. So if work has been your focus or uh, spiritual work has been your salvation or getting out of work has been your goal, uh, you can come to Christ today. You can be saved. If you're saved and work has become an idol or uh, work has become just a necessary evil that you put up with to pay the bills, I invite you to find God's higher purpose and reflect his image by exercising dominion and working in a way that is serving him, pleasing him, accomplishing his purpose, and advancing his kingdom. As we close our service with a song, uh, you can use this time for prayer. Uh, these front steps are always open for someone to come forward and pray and just cement the decision before God. If you need to be saved, as we begin to sing, would you just come forward and someone will meet you that can take you to a side room, pray with you, show you Bible verses, help with questions you have. If you're struggling with this uh, works versus God's work and my work, how it plays into uh, God's purpose, uh, see one of us. Uh, none of us has all the answers, but we're just here to help and and uh, grow through it with you. Uh, so let's respond to God uh, according to the truth that he's shown us in his word today. You can turn to number 553 if you like to have the notes. The words will be on the screen. We want to offer to God our best. So let's stand together, and we're going to sing the first and last verse, but the, it never closes, it never ends. There's plenty of time if you have some praying to do. Uh, you can come forward, sit in your seat, use the lyrics of this song as your commitment to God this morning.
Let's go forth this week and give him our best and give him our all. Uh, Jesus said that, that uh, the night is coming when man can work no more. Paul said, awake, the day is, the night is spent, the day is at hand. And, and so let's use the time God has given us uh, to do his work. Hey, if there's someone here today and uh, that's a real, you know, we talk about working your way to heaven or trying to earn God's favor and you're still struggling in your heart, not so sure about salvation. If I had done what Jesus said in John chapter 3, that unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God, I'm not sure about my spiritual rebirth. Would you come and see me or someone else you saw on the platform or back at the Welcome Center around today and just let us spend some time with you with an open Bible. And um, for the rest of us as we go, um, hope that you'll come back for 6 o'clock service tonight. Stop by the book table in the lobby. Ladies, if you'd love to be part of that study and uh, the money for the book is a problem, please uh, just, just take one and, and let us know about that. Uh, see Miss Betty in the bookstore. She's got some great bargains and a lot of new things as well. Uh, we're going to be dismissed with the chorus, For Me to Live as Christ, just the chorus of that hymn, and uh, hope that it is your anthem of your heart as we go from here with every uh, living breath that he gives us that we'd serve him and accomplish his purpose. For me.